Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to our service this evening, especially those who may be visiting with us. We give a very warm welcome to our preacher for this evening and for tomorrow. Uh, he needs no introduction to most of you. He's well known to you. And we look forward to his ministry uh, this evening and tomorrow. Uh, and we seek to commit him to uh, the Lord in order to do that. So we pray that it would be a blessing to ourselves and a blessing to him as he meets and ministers to us. The Kirk session was opened last night, and if there's anybody belonging to the congregation who's uh, wishing to profess faith in Christ for the first time, we'll be more than happy to meet with you. So we'll be again meeting after the service uh, this evening. Uh, there'll be a fellowship in the church hall in Garbost tomorrow evening where you'll have a further opportunity of hearing Reverend McKeever. Uh, so I would warmly invite you to uh, come to the services, but also uh, come to the fellowship after the services tomorrow. So these are all the things to be intimated, and I'll just hand over to Mr. McKeever now. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you once again in this part of the world, and uh, we trust that, as Mr. Thompson said, we will know the Lord's blessing together as we worship him uh, this evening and in anticipation of the Lord's day as well. We're going to begin our uh, worship this evening in Psalm number 30. Psalm number 30 in the Scottish Psalter, page 239 of the Blue Psalm Books. Verses 1 to 5. Lord, I will thee extol, for thou hast lifted me on high, and over me thou to rejoice mayst not mine enemy. O thou who art the Lord my God, I in distress to thee, with loud cries lifted up my voice, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, my soul, thou hast brought up and rescued from the grave, that I to pit should not go down alive, thou didst me save. O ye that are his holy ones, sing praise unto the Lord, and give unto him thanks when ye his holiness record. For but a moment lasts his wrath, life in his favour lies, weeping may for a night endure, at morn doth joy arise. These verses from the beginning to God's praise. Lord, I
Let's now call upon the Lord in prayer. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious and eternal God, we give thanks that we are here this evening as we come to be together as worshippers of your holy name. And as we gather, O Lord, under your word, so we pray that we might indeed be thankful as we have been singing, even as we recall your holiness. Lord, we give thanks that your holiness is a holiness that is uncreated and unbegun and unending and unchangeable. And we give thanks, O Lord, that while your holiness is an awesome thing, yet as you give your people knowledge of yourself, your holiness does not repel them, but rather draws them to you. We pray that that may be our experience, Lord, this evening, as we gather in your name and to worship you. We thank you for the way in which our very gathering here is ample testimony to your goodness, Lord, even to the very fact that you exist. For if you did not exist, we would not exist, and nor would we have this desire to gather together for such a purpose as this evening. And we thank you, O Lord, for all that you have been to us, not only through the course of our own lives, but down through the centuries and the millennia of your church's experience. You have always been to them the covenant God who has fulfilled his promises so wonderfully, the God who comes with his blessing even when we at times least expected, and certainly at all times, Lord, we know we don't deserve it. We pray tonight for your blessing. You alone are able to enter into our hearts, to read our thoughts and our minds. You alone have the capacity to deal with what you see in us and provide for us and work within us that which is commensurate with our need. O oh Lord, our God, we give thanks tonight that you are able to do for us even exceeding abundantly above what we are able to ask or even think. And we thank you for the many times that you have exceeded our askings for the way you have come with that which has surprised us at the extent of your blessing. And so we pray during these days, O oh Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us once again. We acknowledge, Lord, that however many times we have come to your word and had your word in our experience blessed, yet we need it every time we come. We need that your Holy Spirit should take hold of our minds and our hearts and once again bless your word to us. We thank you for these words that have reminded us, Lord, as we sang them, of how we need your power. You are the one who awakens us from our spiritual death, who brings us to be quickened, energized by your spirit, brought into a living communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray tonight, Lord, that uh, these great truths will be more and more precious to us as days go by. And we pray that this time of communion might also be a means by which you bless your people under your word. So, Lord, we pray your blessing for every individual here this evening and for every home that we represent. We pray that your blessing will be within our homes, within our communities and districts. We long for the day, Lord, when you again will manifest your power as in days gone by. Yet help us, O oh Lord, as we lament the lack of the spiritual advance that we see in our communities and around us and even within ourselves. Yet, Lord, help us not to be despondent, but enable us to continue to believe in you, to believe in the power of your truth and to believe in the benefits of fellowship with your people. And we pray tonight, O oh Lord, as we prepare for the Lord's Day, for the benefits and privileges and advantages of the Lord's Day, we pray, gracious one, that you'd prepare our hearts, that we may receive your word as we ought, that engrafted word that is able to produce within us by your blessing, that spiritual fruit of righteousness that will give praise to your name. And so we ask that your blessing tonight will be with all whom we love and know in the world. Remember, Lord, we pray those who as yet are not saved, we pray especially those familiar with the gospel but have not accepted that great invitation, indeed that instruction and command to come to you, 
And we pray that you would even over these days that you would bless your word to that end that sinners may be saved. And we pray that your people will be nourished and strengthened. Help us, Lord, we pray, in all aspects of our lives to depend upon you and to realize that even though we at times acknowledge rightly that our faith is so short of what it should be in strength, yet we thank you, Lord, that as you give faith to your people, they draw through that faith such immense power, uh, such immense privilege and blessing as you are able to give us. So bless, we pray, any tonight as well who may have thoughts of coming to take their place with your people at the Lord's Supper for the first time. Lord, we know that in most of our congregations there are such people whose genuine desire it is to come and join with the Lord's people and come to sit and take this cup and take this bread. Oh, we pray tonight, O oh Lord, that any such in this congregation might be moved, they might be moved so that they will come to yield obediently to your own command to do this in remembrance of you. And we pray for them, Lord, and ask that you would encourage them to do this, even however many thoughts they may have of themselves and their insufficiency and inadequacy and undeservingness. Yet, Lord, show them your own sufficiency, uh, show them your own beauty, show them the completeness of your work, so that we may all come in dependence upon that to present ourselves again before God. Remember, we pray, uh, the needs of the congregation here in its entirety. We pray for those unable to be with us tonight who are ill, those in hospital, uh, those, uh, Lord, who are unable uh, uh, as before to attend the means of grace. Remember them, we pray, let your good hand be upon them, we pray. And uh, may we find, O oh Lord, that uh, they too come to benefit from uh, the provision that you have made for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember our land at this time, we pray, uh, amongst so much uh, uncertainty, even turmoil at times. Yet, Lord, you remain in your great and holy repose, perfectly above all of these things. And we know that we can look to you with confidence as one who rules all things to your own glory and whose purpose is behind every event that takes place in the creation. And we pray that we may convey uh, ourselves, Lord, uh, into your care at this time with confidence. Bless those who rule over us. Uh, bless those in government, uh, those in opposition, those in local government as well as, as in national. O oh Lord, pity us, we pray, in your long-suffering and mercy toward us. Turn us away from the ways of sin, from that which we know is deplorable in your sight. Lord, our God, look upon us in your great mercy, for we have no refuge anywhere else, and we have no help anywhere else, and there's no answer to our problem except in yourself and in your power. And so we wait upon you and commit all of these things to you, asking that you'd bless us now and wash us freely from our sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to sing once again to God's praise in Psalm 130. Again, it's in the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 130, page 421, the whole psalm. Lord, from the depths to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, do thou hear, and to my supplications voice give an attentive ear. Lord, who shall stand, if thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, but yet with thee forgiveness is, that feared thou mayest be. And so on through to the end of the psalm, Psalm 130, Lord, from the depths to thee I cried. Lord, from the depths to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, to the hills, unto my supplications, Lord, 
letter to the Romans and chapter 3. We can begin reading at verse 9. Romans 3 at verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are all under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. May God add his blessing to a reading once again of his word. Let's praise him once again, this time in Psalm 32, in Sing Psalms, Psalm number 32, that's on page 38, verses 1 to 6. How blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sin, whose sins are covered from God's face, whose debt is cancelled in God's grace. There's no deceit in him. When I kept silent, all my bones with groaning were worn out. Beneath your hand I felt entrapped. Both day and night my strength was sapped as in a summer drought. Then I laid bare my sin to you, the guilt that lay within. I said, O Lord, I have transgressed, and you forgave when I confessed. You pardoned all my sin. 
so let the godly pray to you while you are to be found. Surely when waves are sweeping past and mighty waters rising fast, you'll keep them safe and sound. These verses in Psalm 32, how blessed the one who has received. Oh, bless the one who has received forgiveness for his sin, whose sins are not worth chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll read uh, the first five verses. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Well, in these great words of this passage, uh, verses 1 to 11, indeed, if you take that as a passage that's complete in itself, you might say that it contains what you could call the fruit of justification in these first five verses, and then verses 6 to 11, uh, the foundation of our justification in the death of Christ. Both foundation 
and the fruit of our justification are of great importance to us as believers, of course. But you must never confuse these. You must never actually think of the fruit of justification. Those things that we'll see tonight uh, are enjoyed by God's people. You must never think of these as foundational to your justification. The foundation is Christ himself and his righteousness as it's passed on or imputed to us by God through faith. And indeed, that would be a very uh, serious mistake to confuse the foundation and the fruit. So when you're looking for assurance, you don't look first and foremost at the fruit of your justification, you look at the foundation of it. Because the things that you find in the fruit of justification, when you take account of your faith, how your faith sometimes fluctuates, how you find yourself uh, in your Christian experience fluctuating from time to time, well, that never is the case with your foundation. Uh, the more you are convinced that Christ is the foundation of your righteousness, of your standing before God, the more you're going to go to that for your assurance rather than for the things that from day to day may fluctuate to some extent and waver. Now, if you take these chapters of Romans together, these opening chapters of Romans, you can see uh, from chapter 1, verse 18, right through to chapter 3, verse 20, what you could call our need of justification, our need of forgiveness, because Paul is dealing there with the doctrine of sin, and he's dealing with the doctrine of sin in a way that not only has it affected us personally in our own human being, it's obviously affected also our relationship with God. Our standing before God is gone due to our sin, our fallenness. And then when you come to uh, chapter 3, verse 21, down to chapter 4, verse 25, you move from the need for our justification to the way of justification, the way we come to be justified, because of there it speaks so much about faith and the necessity of faith and what faith is, what faith is in terms of it being the, ma the manner in which we come to be joined to Christ and receive of his righteousness. So tonight we're looking in these verses uh, in chapter 5 at the fruit of justification. As we said, the foundation follows in the, in the verses 6 uh, to, to 11. And when you come to the beginning of the chapter there, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, um, the tenses that the Bible uses, the kind of language, the, the grammar of the Bible is so very important to us. And you'll notice it's saying there, since we have been justified. It's not something we've done to ourselves. It's so, something that's happened from God's point of view, something that God has done that has involved us. And the way it's put there uh, literally means it's happened once and for all. Uh, this justification, this being justified, is something where God makes his own declaration of his people being righteous through faith in Christ. They come to possess his righteousness. And that's how God sees them from then on. Because they are now in Christ, acceptable, as we'll see, they have peace with God, they have a standing with God, they have the hope of the glory of God, and they rejoice even in their sufferings. And there are four things in the passage that Paul brings out that we can look at very briefly as the fruit of our justification. The first of these, we've mentioned there, we have peace with God. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying, having been justified, now that this is in place, now that God has done this, now that God has imputed to us the righteousness of Christ, we have that standing in him, we have peace with God. And of course, these words with God take us immediately to, to the matter of relationship. We have peace with God. And this is not, again, primarily, first and foremost, the peace that you experience in your heart as a Christian. The peace that you experience in your heart has itself to be based on something else. And that peace that you experience in your heart, in your relationship with God, has come about because he has created this peace with himself. It's really very 
close to the idea of reconciliation, but where you have that, you have the relationship between us and God remarkably changed. No longer is there the hostility that's toward us from God rightly because of our sin. Instead of that, you have peace with God, a relationship reinstalled, if you like, as it was in the beginning, except this time it's for keeps. It's because Christ's righteousness is secured for us, and that will not change. Being justified, having been justified by faith, having been accounted righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the peace you experience in your heart, which we say sometimes is at, uh, at sometimes greater than, than in your experience than others, it, it can actually wane, it can increase, it can become somewhat depleted. But this peace on which it's based, this relationship with God, this objective peace, if you like, that God has created through Jesus Christ, that does not change. Your life uh, in terms of your peace that you enjoy in your heart is based upon that. And uh, what's affirmed here is really something that's so, so precious to us. And as we said a minute ago, we come to this particular matter for our assurance rather than to the things that we find in terms of experience or feelings or emotions or affections. That's not where you begin. You begin at the foundation of your justification, and that's in the peace that God has created through what Christ has done, this relationship that he has set up. And all human beings need this peace. Indeed, as you look out over the world, one of the things that it's crying out for is peace. There are people in the world today who would give their right hand to have the peace, even the outward peace, the community peace, the peace that we have in terms of providence that we enjoy from day to day. There are so many people in the world, not just in Ukraine, but many other places where parents can't feed their children, where there's famine, where there's destruction, where there's violence, where there's all sorts of uh, terrible goings on in the world, people craving peace. But there are other people under the gospel who are also seeking peace, looking for peace for their souls, looking for something which is more certain than the kind of peace the world gives you, whether it's in economic or political financial, moral terms, that's not really the peace that lasts and is enjoyed for, forevermore. And tonight we have the privilege as Christians of knowing that peace for ourselves and that peace as it rests on the peace that God has created in Christ for us. is a peace that you bring with you to the Lord's table, God willing, tomorrow because you're coming there to the foundation, not the table itself, but what it sets out, the spiritual realities that it sets out for you to do with the death of Christ, the death of the Jesus who now lives and who meets with his people as they go through life. But this brings us to the foundation. That's why it's so important for us to do this in remembrance of him. It's not just primarily, although it is that because it's his command, but it's also for our benefit, as you know that we will once again come to reflect upon and think upon deeply what God has created for us through the cross. He's created peace. He's created our reconciliation with himself, which we can reach out and take to ourselves by faith and say, this is what I need. This is what I want. This is where, uh, where I need to be in my relationship with God and also with the world in which I live. And so, you see, there's there's the wonderful thing that, that's true of you as you come to the Lord's Supper. You're saying something like this. This judge who God is has turned from being my judge to condemn me to being my friend. You sit at that table to remember the Lord's death. And the God that you remember has done this for you in Christ is now your friend. What a transformation in the relationship that you and I have with God. 
from being at enmity with him and his hostility or enmity toward us. And now we sit at his table. We pray for his presence. We pray that he will be there too and that he will show himself to us. We pray that he will guide us again to see spiritually for ourselves the beauty of this foundation, the beauty of this righteousness, the beauty of this person, this Jesus, by faith in whom we have peace with God. And I hope that's your own experience this evening here, that you know of this peace for yourself. It's something that you and I need to make personal, because part of what the offer of the gospel is, is that this peace in Christ is offered so that we will come to give ourselves to Christ and come, therefore, to enjoy peace of soul on the basis of this peace that he has created. Think of it in terms of reconciliation. I used this illustration many times. Uh, those of you who know me will know that uh, you'll be very familiar with it, I'm sure. But when you think of uh, two countries or two parties that are at war with each other and they come to draw up a peace charter, all the clauses are actually made up so that they're agreeable to both sides. And of course, we're thinking of God making up his peace charter. He's the one who's initiated it. He's the one who's drawn it up. We haven't had a, ha a hand in that. He's done that for us in Jesus. And in the, in, the, in the gospel, he's saying, here is what I'm offering to you in the gospel. I'm offering to you this peace. I'm offering to you this reconciliation. Everything from my side of it has been completed. It's acceptable to me. And I have made sure that everything from your side of it, from the human standpoint, is also provided. It's also complete. There's nothing you need more than I have done already. And that's what the gospel is saying to you. And that's why it's a free offer from what God has already done. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we have a standing before God, it logically follows from what we said already. Through, through him, we also have obtained access by faith, you see, it's again by faith, into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the, whole, in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, what does he mean by this grace in that context? Well, it means precisely this relationship that we now have in our being justified. This relationship we have with God, where we're no longer at enmity, where there is the reconciliation and friendship and the establishment of peace, we have access by faith into this grace. We are fully brought into the standing that Jesus himself has. You think of that. How acceptable are you in Christ to God the Father? As acceptable as his own beloved Son is. Because you are in him. And as you are in him, so you have access into this standing, this grace, this acceptance in which we stand. Now, when you find a, a king, let's uh, say the, the king, now King Charles, if uh, when it comes to the point, as, as was with the Queen, of course, the late Queen, uh, somebody, for example, uh, being uh, awarded uh, something like an MBE or knighthood or something like that, and uh, they stand about in, in wherever it is they're, they're standing, in a palace somewhere, in a room, whatever, and they're waiting until they're called into the presence of His Majesty in order to have this conferred upon them, whether it's pinned on them or with a sword conferring knighthood or, or whatever it is on them. But you know, that's how it goes. The king is standing there, then the person is announced, and then they come and they meet with the king and they receive whatever it is the king gives to them by way of his gift. Well, there's a great verse in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, uh, where Peter is dealing with something very similar to do with, with the death of Jesus and uh, remember how he puts it there where uh, in uh, chapter 3, verse 18 of, of 1 Peter, you find uh, the death of Jesus again, the suffering of Jesus actually brought, brought before us. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. 
You might say that he might usher us into the presence of God, just like that person ordinarily ushering somebody who's going to get their MBE or knighthood into the presence of the king. Well, this is what Jesus has done by the death of the cro- on the cross. This is really effectively, spiritually what's happened. You can just picture it, if you like, as Jesus bringing this person to the Father. We're just speaking here in terms of, uh, of, of illustration rather than what actually happens, but think of it in that way. It might help. Here is Jesus saying, to the Father, this person, please confer righteousness upon this person. They now have come to believe in me. They have received what we have completed for sinners. And now this righteousness belongs to them, this standing in your presence, Father. I just think of how amazing it is as you come to the Lord's table, God willing, tomorrow you come already having this standing with God in your relationship, this acceptance in Christ. And think as you sit, God willing to take that bread and take that cup, to eat of that bread and drink of that cup, as that represents the death of Jesus to you. Think then at that moment, I have a standing in the presence of God where I could not be more acceptable to him than I am in Jesus Christ and because of him. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Even that point itself. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We are acceptable and made acceptable to him. And that is never going to change because it's based upon what Jesus has done, who he is and what he's done. It's not like uh, we've seen recently in terms of, and indeed you see it down through the course of the years anyway, somebody who's prime minister or even a king, uh, they are there for some time, sometimes short, sometimes long. In any case, however long or short they're in, they're in office, it comes to the point where uh, they are no longer uh, in power because the people have voted them out. And the standing you have in the presence of God is never something that you're going to lose. You're never going to be voted out of that status, that standing that you have with your God, with God your Father. The only way that that could happen is if God himself at some point found something wrong in what Christ had done you know that that's never going to take place. And that's where your assurance lies. Accepted in the beloved, always accepted in the beloved, accepted in him we have access into the standing. Thirdly, he says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, there's much, as you know, uncertainty about just now in our world and even in our own nation, maybe even in our own locality and maybe even in terms of your own experience in your life or in your family, maybe things which uh, cause you anxiety, things which you hope will have an end, things you hope that uh, uh, things will develop so that uh, the situation will become easier or whatever. You hope that with our nation as well, that things will will settle down. You hope that with Ukraine, with the wars in the world, you hope that things will improve. But there's no guarantee that that will be the case. That hope does not have a certain foundation to it by which you could say, this hope is a certain hope. But there is in the hope of the Christian. That's why it is a certain hope, or as Peter puts it in the opening words of his first, first epistle as well, uh, who has uh, caused us to be born again to a living hope, a hope that is full of life. Why is the hope of God's people different to the ordinary hope that you and I have as you go through the course of life? Well, because it's based on something that will not change. It's based on the death of Christ. It's based on the resurrection of Christ too from the dead. 
And you'd hope towards life in heaven, towards being with God in heaven, is a sure and certain hope, not because you're able to describe it perfectly, not because you're able to, if you like, feel it or experience it or the benefits of it perfectly. It is a sure and certain hope because it's based on two things, two things that are constantly tied together. The first is the resurrection of Christ, joined to his death, but also the promise of God. The promise of God and what Christ has done. That's what secures your Christian hope. That's what makes it a certain hope. And what he's saying here, we rejoice, uh, we, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And the word rejoice there is actually a very strong word. It means more than just a little bit of, of joy or whatever. It, it actually means very strongly something that you really uh, uh, have a confidence in to the extent that you really rejoice in it. You can lay your weight upon it. You can have confidence in, uh, in, in, uh, in this. And so it, it provides you with that assurance again, doesn't it? This, this finished work of Christ. Uh, and uh, you can see it saying here, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now there's a question that arises there. What does he mean in this context by the glory of God? Well, we know that the Bible speaks about the glory of God as the glory that belongs to him, the glory that is his as God, the inexpressible, ind indescribable glory that belongs to him properly as God, a glory that is his exclusively. But here he's talking about us Christians rejoicing in hope or having a confident hope of the glory of God. And it's not simply that we will come to be glorified in heaven, although that is certainly the case. And you remember in chapter 8 how Paul includes that in, in what he's actually saying, um, that uh, the whole creation itself is waiting for the manifestation of the children or the, the, uh, or the, the sons of God groaning together in the pains of childbirth. And now he says, we have this hope. And in this hope we were saved. Well, this uh, glory of God includes within what Paul is talking about here, actually being found in the likeness of God. Now, we will never come to have a divine glory. That's exclusively God's. All the things that are true of him, that make him the God he is, the glorious God he is, we will never be deified. But we have a God-given hope, and we have a God-given fulfillment of that hope in the glory that we will be glorified with. And the glory that God's people will be glorified with will be itself the image of the glorified Christ. It's connected to him and to his glory. We shall be like him. And as Paul says in Romans 8 as well again, um, that this is really what, uh, what God had always, always perf purposed, uh, where he says that for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. He's not just saying the image of Jesus, because when Paul says the image of his Son, he means the eternal Son of God. And this is the wonderful destiny that awaits God's people, that they're going to be like Christ glorified. They are going to be bearers of his image perfectly. They're going to be conformed to the image of his Son. And we, he says, rejoice in the hope of that. Well, why wouldn't you? How could we be anything else but rejoicing in hope of such a thing as conformity to Christ? Isn't it one of the things that you're bringing to the Lord's table, uh, your own complaint and my own complaint about ourselves, at least how we perceive things and see things, we do not find ourselves fitting that category of being like Jesus, of being like him at all. 
although we know that's what the Bible teaches us. But you're so aware of sin every day that you wrestle with, things that you actually have that you keep on repeating in terms of your life as a sinner, even as a saved sinner. And that troubles you, and you're longing for the day when um, uh, the Lord will take you to be like himself perfectly. And really, that's what the Lord's Supper, too, is about. Do this, says Paul, in remembrance of Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And when he comes, the image will be perfect and you will be in his likeness. And right now, as you go to the Lord's table, you rejoice in the hope of that glory of God. And you know that that table itself is used by the Lord. Here's, here's the thing that's so important for us to remember, friends, as well. That the Lord's table, Lord's supper, is not just a means of witness to the world as to who Christ is and that he's your Savior and you are his people. It's actually first and foremost a means of grace to your soul. It's a channel through which God ministers grace, life to you. Because as you take these elements of bread and the cup of wine, and as they remind you powerfully of what Christ has done for you, so you're also aware of the fact that God is taking these means of grace, his word and sacrament together to be by his blessing a further preparation of you for the glory of God in heaven in his image. And so the Lord's table, you see, is such, such an exceedingly important thing. Um, and uh, if you're here tonight and you have not been to the Lord's Supper yet, and it's on your heart to do this, and it's your desire to do this, it's been your desire maybe for some time, and you know that the benefits for you are, 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 are laid out for you in the Bible. But don't think primarily about the benefits to yourself, although that's important, of course. Think about it as God's own means or instrument of preparing you for this life in heaven. Uh, there are many people in heaven, we're sure, who never sat at the Lord's table. The thief on the cross never sat at the Lord's Supper. Many others went through life like that as well. But then that should be the exception, not the norm. And on the basis of what Christ has done, do this in remembrance of him. Let it be to you also a means of grace to strengthen you for your Christian life. So we have peace with God. We have a standing before God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. One final point, briefly to finish. We rejoice also in our sufferings. Not only that, he says, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that the suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Uh, apologies for trying to rush through that quickly. Uh, it's one of those passages where you can take it like this and it's, it's very much an advantage to see it, um, just like you see my, perhaps the weather chart in its entirety, and then you can zoom in and look at things in different localities. Well, that's what Paul is doing here. We could zoom in and uh, look at any of these elements in themselves and expand on them. But this is what he's saying in, in, in its totality. He's saying we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing what that means. And because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Well, sufferings there, the word really is tribulations. They're not just minor sufferings, Though these come into it, it's tribulation, it's kind of suffering where you, you have, especially in relation to the gospel, to spiritual things themselves, you have in your own heart of hearts things that are difficult to contend with. And anybody who knows anything about striving with sin knows you're in a battle. 
not just the world out there, it's the world in here too. And when we're serious about holiness, that's really what we have to get down to killing, killing the deeds of the body, killing the lusts of the flesh, putting them to death, that's mortification of sin. But here is Paul saying, we rejoice in our suffering, a strange thing in many ways, rejoicing in suffering. Why can he rejoice in suffering? Well, he tells us because, again, it's a means that God uses in order to bring uh, the believer to be more productive of spiritual fruit in their lives. And part of this fruit that follows justification is the fact that God uses suffering in their experience in such a way that leads to further improvement in their spiritual condition. Now again, don't confine the thing to your feelings. Believe God's word for what it says. And don't subject it to your own assessment of it when you say, well, I don't feel holy. Neither do I. Neither does anybody who's really holy. When you go to the basis of it and to the promise of God and to the nature of what God is doing. And what he's saying here fits in with what he's saying elsewhere, especially to the likes of uh, the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. He's talking about heavy afflictions, persecutions. He gives a list of them to the Corinthians when he calls it our light affliction. Why does he call it our light affliction? Well, he says, it's working for us an eternal weight of glory. See the contrast? Heavy experiences are really heavy persecution, but they're light afflictions because what's waiting him for him is the weight of glory. And it will always be the case that the weight of that glory that is ahead of God's people is always going to be more substantial and heavier than the weight of any sufferings in this life. Always keep that before your mind as well. Because, he says, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Well, that opens up a lot of avenues of uh, hope through the Holy Spirit who is given to us as a first deposit of what is to come. And that Holy Spirit works in the hearts of God's people, maintaining that in them which God has begun and which will be completed in glory. We have peace with God. We have a standing before God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And we rejoice even in our sufferings too. May God bless these thoughts on his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give thanks that you are in charge of the lives of your people. Uh, we give thanks that you are the governor of redemption and that not only do you apply it to your people, but you also maintain these great benefits that we receive from you. We pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will make clearer to us our standing in your presence our acceptance before you, the completeness with which you receive us on the basis of what Christ has done. And help us, we pray, to have confidence even in our sufferings that in your hands they work towards our final good. So receive our thanks, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing in conclusion now from Psalm 33. Uh, this again in the, sings, uh, sorry, in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 33 at page 246 uh, from verse 17 to the end of the psalm. A horse for preservation is a deceitful thing and by the greatness of his strength can no deliverance bring. And of course in those days of the psalmist horses were very much to the fore in terms of military, uh, uh, military prowess, military strength uh, and the more horses um, a king or whoever had the more strength was given to his defense. But here he says the horse itself, compared to God, is a deceitful thing. And so it goes on to speak about God's protective care and provision for all those who put their trust in him. So from verse 17, we'll sing on to the end of the psalm to God's praise.
Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>